You know what you need, Will? Yeah, what's that? You need 18 gigs of RAM on your smartphone. Guy like you. Sure. I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't sound convinced. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's, a, that's quite quite a lot. Listen. What man. am I doing here? Listen. <laughs> you're playing games, obviously. Okay, sure. Here's the thing. I mean, certainly with a RAM count like that, it's obvious that it's a spec contest that's going on. If you want to call yourself the supreme super phone thing you got to win in this variety of categories mm -hmm. which happens to include ram sure and that's where this device comes in the rog phone 5 to pack a whopping 18 gigabytes of lp ddr5 ram this is maybe this is more than you have in laptops it's more than many people have in their desktops uh, and it's 18. And it's 18. It's two more than like a regular. Which is two more than 16. 18. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It's a great observation. <laughs> the 18 gigabyte LPDDR5 mobile DRAM module comes from SK Hynix semiconductor based out of South Korea. And they said that this chip runs at a maximum of 6,400 megabits per second, which is around 20% faster than previous LP DDR5 RAM. It's got to be fast RAM, too. It can't be any RAM. It's got to be fast RAM. And certainly with these ROG phones, they have been targeting the champion status as far as... I mean, mostly uh, targeting gamers, right? Sure. The, the gamer crowd has emerged as this opportunity for smartphone makers to go after some crazy spec sheets because in certain circumstances, that's pretty much the only crowd who can really take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. uh, some other specifications on this device, Snapdragon 888, that's a must. Pretty much, I mean, what other chip can you possibly have to pair with that much memory? High refresh OLED display, no specs on how high refresh, though we've had these previous ROG phones up at some crazy numbers, 144 hertz type of thing. Uh, many mobile games not even supporting such a thing, mm. but you know, there 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 are segments, there are places where competitive gaming on mobile is a real thing. I remember having visited. I was in Taiwan. I, I remember having visited. I was in the room over there, and they're showing me what they were working on, and 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 it's all kinds of specialty. Uh, adapters and such in mm -hmm. order to support the booming, the booming competitive gaming scene on mobile. Yeah. Mostly in Asia, but starting to spread out a little bit. And it kind of makes sense because you think about it with competitive gaming, right? The appealing part, being a fan of competitive gaming, uh, esports in general, one of the cool aspects of it, Will, is that you can partake as an audience member. In other words, what I mean to say by this is you can you can imagine yourself being like that competitive gamer because yeah. you can pick up your phone, load the game, and be like, I'm training right now. Mm -hmm. I'm about to be that other thing. Whether, whether it's on PC or console or you can get yourself the tools of the trade. Yes. I guess you could say the same thing about sports to a certain extent, but maybe a lesser degree. You know, I, I grew up playing hockey. Yep. I still do. One of the problems with hockey outside of the winter time is getting like it's difficult to get ice. Mm -hmm. You need to have a whole you need to have a whole uh team organization to step on the ice and it's expensive. Yep. And you're pretty much not playing hockey. There's other things you can do, stick handling drills and sure. Uh, you can play street hockey, things like this. You could even get rollerblades if you really wanted to. Where yep. where I'm going with this is when it comes to esports, the appealing part is you have everything you need potentially in your setup. Mm -hmm. You can get a fast connection with low latency. You can get a high performance PC if that's the angle you're taking. Or in the case of mobile gaming, you can get the same phone, the exact same equipment as the person that you're watching. Yes. And you don't have the same limitation as far as access, which may come along with more traditional sports. Yeah, I guess the only. 
differentiator is maybe the mobile connection. Yeah, connection is going to be a big one. If yeah. you have if you have a crap connection, you're going to suffer horribly. You're gonna you're gonna lose out. But as a pro gamer, you can literally get like the same phone, same specs. Same specs. So it's same kind of setup. I understand the appeal of it. You want to have the tools to trade, and you know what these manufacturers are going to do with these gaming phones. They're going to go and sponsor the right people, mm -hmm. and therefore, uh, you know, just like sneakers. On a on a professional basketball player, you're gonna want to have the tools that the other that these other guys have access to. You're gonna want these phones, and they're gonna and they kind of send the message more quickly than than uh, like if you look at the design of this thing, they're gonna put a dot matrix display on the back of it. I mean, yeah, that's you, pretty insane. You carry this around in place of what a what a regular selection would look like an iPhone or even an S21 Ultra, you carry this around instead and you're sending a strong signal to people where your interest and enthusiasm happens to be. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a key. And the reason I'm mentioning all this stuff, you're like, wait, wait a second, you're all over the place here. The reason I'm mentioning all this stuff is because from a performance standpoint, is it going to be really all that different from a typical flagship? No. Is it going to be really all that different from an S21 Ultra? No. It's, it's all the accoutrement. It's those extras that provide it with some degree of personality for an individual who's looking for something a little different with a slightly different target. Now, I know 18 gigs of RAM is specific to this unit. You're not going to get that on an S21 Ultra. And that's another key component in the conversation around Superphone. You start nitpicking. You start getting to the, you know, shaving off that little tiny extra performance mm -hmm. that you need to be able to call yourself the champ. And then the accessories are another part from a practical perspective. They're going to come out with a laundry list of accessories, I'm sure, which are going to enhance the gaming experience on such a thing as well. Typically, they've put massive batteries in these units as well. Mm. We're putting the focus back on the gamer who's going to sit there and potentially play for a for an extended period of time. Funny, you're on GSM Arena, and they're, they're listing it as a 16-gig option. So right. who knows which report to go with here Uh XDA developer is pretty re pretty reliable, so seems to me it might be this 18 gig module. Some other aspects that people are interested in and excited about, again, also within this audience, 3.5 mil headphone jack is supposed to be in there and uh, 65 watt fast charging. Oh, okay. And, and, oh, also it will run a, a near stock build of Android 11 out the box. Hmm. So you don't have to worry about too much bloat on there, which is kind of nice. Although it will obviously have some kind of game switch button, game uh, style interface, which will give you all those configuration aspects. Like you don't want to be interrupted, disrupted right. while you're playing, turn off notifications, uh, even potentially overclock the device uh, yeah. for greater performance. So anyway, this is soon, man. I believe, is it public that this event is? I don't know. It's, it's coming soon, very soon. Okay. I'm not going to say the date, but... Well, what does GSM... Does GSM say think? a date? Uh, rumored, expected announcement... There we go, March 10th. Expected announcement. March 10th, Will. Uh, do I need to tell you what day that is? That's two days from now. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's real soon. So I would just say, you know, hang around the channel. Keep an eye out. Because chances are I might play a game or two. Okay. Chances are I might find out about this RAM. Sounds good. First hand. What we got next, we got, oh, OnePlus stuff. So some people caught the video, OnePlus sent the uh, ice cream, the dry astronaut ice cream. By the way, you're a huge fan of it. You stole all of it afterwards. Yeah, I practically grabbed it out, you out of your hands. Yeah, you said, I will it. take all the ice cream. And they packaged it up in a type of something that looks like a smartphone box. And it's all about building hype because sure. they're they're experimenting with how to essentially announce an announcement, which is kind of what they did here. It was it was like an invitation to announcement. Of course, everybody can partake. And it was like, we'll have more to tell you on March 8th. So you were like, okay, now you're announcing an announcement. But then the announcement that they announced was another announcement. You follow yeah. you follow all that? Sure. So Today, which is March 8th, they came out and said, look, we have this partnership with Hasselblad. We already knew the rumors. In fact, in this video, I'm playing around with a Hasselblad camera because we knew the rumors. 
but then that became official. Yes, we're working with Hasselblad. However, in order to find out more, you're going to have to wait till the 23rd. And on the 23rd, they're going to announce another announcement. <laughs> no, on the 23rd, they're going to announce the actual phone or series of phones, which at this point is rumored to be, uh, I believe, three phones and a smartwatch. OnePlus 9, OnePlus 9 Pro, OnePlus 9R, which is supposedly the budget model, and then a OnePlus smartwatch. However, there is a little bit more information about this Hasselblad partnership. For those that don't know, Hasselblad, this company, a, a huge history in photography, m massive megapixel counts, and typically used in commercial photography for huge billboards or potentially sh taking a shot of space. Or they actually brought it up into space. I think it was like the first Apollo mission. I was yeah. Wikipediaing that. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. is where the photo that they were sharing was inspired by, mm -hmm. or people were speculating maybe it was the actual photo. And we also don't necessarily know what this means for the phone. Is there going to be an emphasis on, like I was wondering, is it going to be Zoom or some information seems to come out over here. By the way, OnePlus says that they care about the camera a lot. Traditionally, the cameras haven't been top tier on the OnePlus devices. I think it's fair to say compared to some of the other flagship models. Apparently, OnePlus is going to invest $150 million over the next three years to improve its camera experience. That's the word. Hmm. And as far as the collaboration with Hasselblad, apparently they're going to feature a new color calibration process called Natural Color Calibration, which apparently they developed in conjunction with Hasselblad. And here's the thing about this. Sometimes you just get the name slapped on there, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just they pay uh, some sort of a fee and then it's like, yeah, we're working together. Mm -hmm. But it appears, at least they're trying to get the word out right now, no, 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 we work together. And apparently this is going to serve as its color accuracy and calibration standard going forward. Oh, well, I don't know for how long the deal is worth, but presumably the foreseeable future. And as far as hardware is concerned, apparently Hasselblad worked on this uh, freeform lens, which apparently eliminates distortion that you would get on a regular ultra-wide camera lens. Hmm. So you get the wide image, the expansive image, but without that sort of fisheye effect that takes place on a wide, on a wide angle oh, lens. Like you might have it actually if you switch to that camera right over there. How about this for a dynamic? No, that one up there. Oh, this one? Yeah, there you go. You might have a little bit of that taking place. That's a very wide lens on there. Full frame, 10 millimeter. So some people might not like that effect and might wish for something that looks more like a flat image. And apparently there's some sort of tech that this freeform lens is capable of delivering that ultra wide image, but without the distortion. That's the idea. And I don't know... Is it corrected? If it's in the lens, then it's corrected prior to software because in the past, that's what you'd have to use some software uh, in order to achieve that flattening. You could right. do it in Photoshop and things like this if you had the time or cared to do it. But apparently they figured it out in camera, in lens, through the partnership with Hasselblad. I mean, it's a very convenient story. Like, well, they brought their expertise and all the rest of it. But this is what it looks like, right? Yeah, I mean, you're on a OnePlus page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we know what it looks like. We just don't know the technology. You mean the lens itself? Yeah. Yeah, they're calling it freeform, a freeform lens. I see. Okay. Yeah. And well, uh, as far as the sensor, it's going to be a Sony IMX789 capable of 4K video at 120 FPS or 8K at 30. So add another device to the 8K video group. Mm -hmm. As I'm not sure how useful that is. Enormous file sizes. And usually the 8K feature is lacking certain other camera features like stabilization and mm. so we'll see what the trade-offs are but they're also going to put in some more pro features as far as being able to control get more granular control over things like iso focus white balance and more and uh and then there's going to be a raw raw photos also 12-bit raw so uh, an enhanced focus on camera is a good thing uh, some people think these are marketing tactics when you just go get a name a famous name like I mean, other brands have done it to be clear you've seen Leica pop up yeah Ze you know, Zeiss is it in there Porsche did they work with Porsche is it Porsche no uh, McLaren McLaren yeah yeah Sorry. yeah 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 but that sees when it's a race car 
then it's just like okay, it's inspired by the design, the feel, and the sure. and the and the uh, history. And but when it's a camera company and you put a camera into the phone, then it's a bit different because it's like, oh, have you really transferred those technologies? Right. In the case of Sony, where they have a very intimate relationship with Zeiss, they'll just say, okay, the coating on the lens unit is from Zeiss, mm -hmm. for example. And they make cameras, and there's all these interesting relationships that are out there. But as far as this one's concerned, we're gonna have to wait and see if that if it actually manifests in some in some tangible difference. Mm -hmm. But it at least indicates an increased attention on the camera unit that I think OnePlus OnePlus fans would want, especially considering the new price tag that these flagship OnePlus devices are commanding, which is uh, really up there with. The big name, the big names like mm -hmm. Samsung and others. So that's another really, I mean, really soon thing. Well, we're gonna find everything out at the at the next announcement, as sure. long as it's not another announcement of an announcement. Hopefully not. We'll see. Uh, one more thing on the OnePlus: we have official word that there will be chargers in the box for the OnePlus Nine flagships. Whoosh. I mean, <laughs> the people. Yes. The fact that you need to say that yeah. nowadays is kind of funny. But that's the that's 2021, uh, the vanishing charger. Apple dropped it. Samsung dropped it. OnePlus and others have made a bigger deal in the past over charge speeds. Mm -hmm. Right? Oppo has done similar, saying, "Hey, we got this tremendous 45 watt, 55 watt, mm -hmm. 65 watt charge speed," and it's kind of seems it's almost hard to advertise your incredible charge speeds if you don't have Not that charger. Example. Yeah. So we're in this middle ground, and it's part of what I, maybe in the case of iPhone, you can make the argument it's not such a big deal because those devices have not typically been all that fast charging, nor has Apple made a, put a huge effort into discussing how fast or not or slow their devices tend to charge because they were hanging onto that five watt power brick for so long. Samsung, a little less so, but again, Samsung, Six, six, similar boat to Apple where they didn't ever make a huge deal sure. out of charge speeds. But these companies, on the other hand, OnePlus included, they've been talking about charge speed forever. You can't take away my power brick because I can't enjoy that new technology that you're busy, you're busy marketing to me mm -hmm. if it's not in the box. And so we have the official word because I believe Pete himself, yeah, the CEO of the company, hopped into the official forum, official OnePlus forum to squash the potential rumor that it wouldn't that they would be done with the with the power brick as well he says don't worry about it we have the charger inside the box in reference to a comment suggesting that the new phones would launch without chargers so it's it's official now and it will be a warp charger the flagship phones come with it now maybe they're lower end devices maybe they'll cut the charger there instead Anyway, the OnePlus 8T came with a 65 watt charge adapter, and the 9 and 9 Pro are expected to get the same. So, likely 65 watt charging in the box. I can't say that I mind. No, because I love no. a fast charge. I told you this. Yeah. I told I told everybody this. I like a fast charge. Yeah. You know, call me terrible, call me evil. Yeah. I like a fast charge. All right, let's get into the iPhone news. How about this feature? I don't know who discovered this. This was uh, Benjamin Mayo on Twitter. I think he works for one of the... Wait a sec. He works for Mac Rumors, 9 to 5 Mac, one of those sites. Okay. He's always, you know, he's sniffing around. Sure. What's going on with Apple? Anyway, this latest one, new iPhone feature alert will alert you if you're being stalked. What a, what a headline, Will. Mm. That'll get your attention, won't it? Yeah. I'm perked. I mean, it actually did get your attention because you sent it to them. <laughs> I did. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You were just scrolling along, trying to have your morning. Sure. And then you found you found yourself perked. Uh huh. And now we're dealing with it through covering this story right here. Oh yeah. So you can become unperked. Uh huh. <laughs> New feature comes as Apple is planning to expand its the uh, Find My app. That's like this. Like I lost my thing, and they're always trying to get you to enable maximum Find My stuff. Mm -hmm. So you have these tags coming out, right? Air tags, which is going to be... Samsung has a product like this. This is the idea. You put this little tag, you never lose anything. Mm -hmm. Tile, and there's been so many products like this, but 
Apple apparently going to invest in such a thing, launch such a thing, sell such a thing. But this guy Benjamin, he found this uh, he found this aspect inside the software where if you were to have an AirTag that didn't belong to you in your stuff, potentially in your backpack, let's say, hmm. if somebody wanted to track your whereabouts, hmm. your phone would warn you about the fact that this thing was present and ask you if you wanted to turn off safety features. You can see the in, inside the tweet, there's like a little uh, screenshot of what the prompt would say. The owner of an unknown item will be able to see your location and you will no longer receive notifications when an unknown item is found moving with you. So your own air tags would obviously have different rules, mm -hmm. but if it was somebody else's air tag associated with some other account that was mm -hmm. capable of knowing your whereabouts, you would get this prompt to know that it was that you you've been bugged. Uh, and I guess the air tag, like you would have an iPhone, mm -hmm. the air tag wouldn't be registered to you, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and somehow they the air tag. Yeah. And the so the way this whole thing other. works, right, is if you do actually lose something then and you report it lost then other iphone users that come across the lost item would be able to contact you view contact information for the item's owner and contact them via text message so the That's air tags are talking to each other yes to the iphone to, to iPhones, iphones in general right but in but only once you've reported the thing lost so the i see so the way in which somebody could utilize this is not report the thing is lost just plant the air tag right. and just follow it around. I suppose that's the idea here. Mm -hmm. But it, it raises some privacy concerns for sure. people because now the, once Apple does something, it becomes ubiquitous. It's like everywhere. All of a sudden, as much as the – I've seen all kinds of reports and I've followed tweet threads about people using Tile and recovering camera equipment. And mm. It's really amazing tech. But it, it comes along with the privacy concerns of, well – what if some nefarious person wants to utilize it to their to their advantage? Mm -hmm. Now, Apple doesn't want to comment on this. They don't even want to say the word stalker. They don't yes. want to encourage anybody. But you can easily see the purpose of this. Yep. Right? I mean, it doesn't even necessarily need to be a stalker, right? It could be... Like, at what point is a person a stalker, actually? Is it like immediately or does it have to be ongoing i don't really care whatever it's creepy either way sure you're planting to, to tag and trying to what if it's your kid though and they're in trouble and they won't tell you exactly you know what i'm saying like a teenager is this like a, a movie am i am i teenager? am i writing a movie right now <laughs> you know what i mean you are yeah the air tag future it's a it's a concerned parent and I think it's still privacy problems. Anyway, point yeah. being is Apple's not going to tell you it, but these little uncovering these things inside of the software, iOS 14.5 beta, you get a better idea of how they're talking about it and thinking about it internally, that they have to be out ahead of the thing before people start using it that way. And then they get the other negative story of like this person had been, had planted the thing in the car and had been tracking the person for however long. Right. It yeah. just gets even, even creepier and worse. So they're going to, Get out in front of it. And you have to. That's part of the thing. You do these hardware, software devices. Well, you need to think about all the potential ways. Well, can they do it for Android? Like, because uh, the person would have to have an iPhone that's like tracked, right? So that that's uh, that way they can get this notification. Yeah, this AirTags is iOS. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, but Samsung has its tags and. I don't know. I sure. actually don't know how Tile would deal with such a thing. I presume it's got some similar features in there that would alert you if you were in possession of someone else's Tile. Sure, but it works for both Android and iOS. I right. guess for this, it would only work for iOS. I presume. Right. Yeah. Well. Another little Apple update here. We've talked extensively about how Apple and other brands have been trying to diversify their production and move some of it away from China. We have a figure here, a number. Apparently now 7 to 10% of iPhone 12 production is going to move from China to India. That's not, not an insignificant amount. I mean, you're talking about millions and millions of phones. Up until recently, the flagship models, in this case the 12, but also previous 11 Pros, things like this, 
wouldn't be the ones to be manufactured locally in India. It would be more the budget models or the previous generation models. Uh, this time around, we're talking about the actual flagship unit, Foxconn assembling those models for both domestic sale and export. So also not just for the Indian market, but potentially to go to other countries nearby. And uh, we have the quote here. The iPhone 12 will be manufactured. This is not a quote. This is from the original article, Money Control. The iPhone 12 will be manufactured at Taiwanese manufacturer Foxconn's facility in Tamil Nadu. Apple is expected to shift 7 to 10% of its production capacity. Under the Indian government's production-linked incentive PLI scheme, Apple has partnered with Foxconn, Wistron, and Pegatron. And the facility was also supposed to manufacture iPhone 12 mini, but that decision is yet to be made. This might have something to do with the popularity or lack of popularity of that particular model. CEO of Apple, Tim Cook, is bullish about the company's prospects in the Indian market. Listen to this. Here's the quote from Tim Cook. This is particularly the case in some of the emerging markets where we're proud of how we've done. If you take India, for example, we doubled our business last quarter compared to a year ago, but our absolute level of business there is still quite low relative to the size of the opportunity, Cook told analysts during a post-earnings call. So this is true. Apple, tiny footprint in India. One of the things that had held them back was this uh, these tremendous tariffs and fees that ended up uh, making their way to the eventual customer. And people sitting there saying, look at this price tag. I can't deal with this. Mm -hmm. Talking about a more expensive price here than in places that may have a, a higher average wage, places sure. like here or... And I'm paying more over here because of these... So. Of course, the idea there was to encourage Apple to do exactly what they're doing, which is now bring some level of manufacturing to that place in order to lower those prices through skipping those tariffs and then potentially growing domestically. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. Now, it's not just India. It's, it's, it's all kinds of countries in Asia that are benefiting from this move away from China. And uh, I guess tech companies, some level of recognition here that being solely dependent on one particular nation might be a little bit risky given shifting political climates and all that stuff. Yeah, you got to diversify. You, you 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 make you make stuff all over the place and then you're a little more robust, a little, a little less centralized. Sure. Remind me of crypto all of a sudden. Uh-huh. Which we're we're going to get to later okay. in the show. Yeah, and during the crypto segment. This oh, I'm excited. Yeah, this show it covers it all. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that well. Yeah. We go all over the place. If it happened on the That's internet. What I heard. Yeah. yeah. If it happened on the internet, we're going to tell you. Okay. And if we don't tell you it, then it never happened on the internet. Yeah. You see how that works. <laughs> you don't have to go anywhere else. Anyway, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a tough move away from China. Uh, Apple, though, is preparing to also bring iPad production to India. And apparently, uh, eventually, Apple is aiming to move 15 to 30% of its production out of china looking for new places to uh potentially be manufactured maybe even the united states at some point could you imagine sure made in the usa i don't know probably not that mac pro thing was more of a you know trump visited and they shook hands and he took one mac pro with him and it was very small volume for apple yeah a phone would be interesting if mm -hmm. they could do such a thing in the u.s anyway uh one more piece of apple news here we're talking about the mixed reality headset. This thing, man, it's keeps making they keep making news with this headset. Yeah, if Apple wants to do it, I mean it's gonna be big. They keep making news with this headset, yet you look at the numbers, you look at the dates, and you're like, What well, man, what are we talking about? This is so far. Okay, so the it's not the mixed reality headset is not that far, 2022. Yes. But then you get into the other, and this is Ming Chi, by the way. And you know I'm a big Ming Chi guy. Sure. So it's fine. Shout out. So it's fine. Like I'm not. I know you gotta do what you gotta do. We're out here working, right? Like you give me this stuff, and now I have stuff to talk about, and it's great. And we all, uh, we all have our communication around. Synergy. Yeah, the things we're enthusiastic about. It's like it's cool, right? We want to talk about tech in the future, and you need new content. But some of these numbers actually, it just, it's hard to be excited. With some of the some of these numbers, 2022 I can get behind. All right, okay. the mixed reality headset comes in 2022. It's like a heavier, less finished device. I mean, you could see the drawing over here. 
I, I don't know why I'm saying less finished, but I mean, it's just not all that futuristic. It looks like a lot of other headsets that are out there. Sure. The glasses and stuff that people are more pumped about, the, the idea of all this technology shrinking down, Ming Chi's got a date on that. He says 2025. All right, now I'm getting less. I'm like, 2025, man. What am I doing in 2025? What's 2025 look You're like? Am I Mars. alive in 2025? That's what I want You're to know. living in Mars. Yeah, man. Oh, right. Okay. It's true. He said 2026 to Mars, didn't he? Yeah. So I mean, you're you're already suited up. And then Apple comes with the with the glasses anyway. And then this is where things really get out of control. He then goes on to say the contact lens type by 2030 to 2040. <laughs> then I'm just now I'm out. I don't. That's so hard to. And then it's a 10 year window. So yeah. it's like, what kind of intel do you have here? It is cool. Uh, contact lens augmented reality seems to be the science fiction future in, inevitably mm -hmm. that we would have all this tech on, si uh, on on a contact lens. You don't even have to right. see it. It's lightweight. I mean, I wear those things anyway. Yeah. Like what happens in cyberpunk? Do you get a contact lens? Yeah. It's uh, called, I think, cyberware. And it's kind of like augmented cyber stuff on your body. But is it... it you get it, like an eyeball implant. Oh, you get the whole eyeball. Yeah. Interesting. It's not like a... I'm surprised they didn't lens. do a contact lens. They went, they went for well, a whole eyeball. Well, maybe they did and then they skipped it. Like they moved on. The to eyeball like the was even better. Eyeball. Yeah. I mean, that seems just a little more invasive. You got to do the whole eyeball. I know. I might still need that eyeball. Well, they'll give you a little bag. Yeah, it's true. I know. They, yeah. You know, with the eyeball. I know. They'll figure it all out. Anyway, this initial uh, mixed reality headset... The key, they got to get the weight right. Apparently, it's going to be between two and 300, gr 300 grams, but they're aiming at 100 to 200 grams. So they got to chisel it down because these things are uncomfortable on your face. You've worn way more of these things on your face than I have. How big of a deal is the weight of it? It is bothersome, yeah. to be honest. Even like, especially with glasses, mm. um, which is the worst case scenario for VR. So you're, you're doing, just, the, you do like the lenses glasses lenses. and then the headset over the glasses. It's very uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the nub that kind of digs into the nose bridge. Yeah, yeah. It's annoying, yeah. yes. but it's tolerable. Once you get into the immersiveness, it's not too bad. Anyway, Apple wants to get that weight down even further. There sure. was talk previously of them using all types of fabrics and things in order to do that. Apparently, they're going to use micro OLED displays from Sony and the resolution that people were talking about, 8K and stuff. It was like all kinds of crazy stuff. So apparently, the price point in 2022 is still going to be like a thousand bucks or something in this in this territory. Yeah. Uh, we'll see how, I mean, everybody, it's a competitive, it's actually a surprisingly competitive market, right? Mm -hmm. uh, AR, VR, it's, it seems here to stay and, and it just hasn't. It's almost like early days smartphones where you knew that eventually it was going to be this thing, but it's got to be a lot of Blackberries and Palm Trios before you get to the iPhone moment. Yeah. And I'm not necessarily saying Apple has to be the one to reach it, but I'm just saying that the smartphone really had its magical lightning bolt at this, it sure. needed, a, you needed a, all the things connected. It was just the, the timing and everything yeah. else and I think AR is going to have that moment at some right. point. Here's a cool one. Another one that you sent me. How about this? A, a phone. By the way, this is a shout out Canada, Canadian story. This happened at Harrison Lake. There was an iPhone 11 at the bottom of that lake, which was salvaged. It had been down there for six months. And this diver, you know, these diver types, they go to, they go to try to find little treasures and things and knickknacks and mm -hmm. Down at the, it's it's a fun. A lot of them have YouTube channels. Every yes. so often in trending, you'll see like, look what he found. Which is good content. Uh, yeah, it's cool. Along with this, the swimmer or the diver, and then like see what we can find. It's cool. Yeah, it's POV. It's like mystery. It's POV, and then although I always wondered, hmm. I mean, if you need content, you could plant stuff down there. Right? Sure. Yeah. Uh, why do I have to say that? I don't. You. <laughs> I'm not accusing you anyone. It. No, I'm not, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this was planted. No, but, I don't uh, think this one was planted. I, I mean, I don't know because I got an interview in here from the original owner and the, they tell a story of when they, when they lost it. That's why I think these ones are even better. When there's actually the follow-up and then sure. the original owner gets it back 
Because yeah. now you have all these extra story components and it, 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 it lends a little more authenticity to the whole exchange. As opposed to, I found a $10,000 diamond ring. Yeah. And then you're like, wait a sec. You want to know the life that they live losing the product. Like, it's key. They, what phone did they get? Afterwards? Yeah, it's key. Well, actually, in this particular story, by the way, I should just say this phone survived six months yeah, at the that's bottom. A, that's amazing. At story. the bottom of the lake, <laughs> and it's still working. They booted sure. it up, and everything was there. They called the original owner and actually got the phone back. But there's little tidbits in the story that are kind of cool, of 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 the original owner, for example, not like not having all these photos that they shot from this trip at that lake. That looks like a cold lake. Well, right now, yeah, they're in uh, they're in the Vancouver area because the person who lost or the person who lost it was from Vancouver. Let's get an update. Where exactly is Harrison Lake? It could be inland in BC. It could be further north, which would make it colder than Vancouver. Harrison Lake, BC. Look at this. Wow! Imagine the time you could have a little vacation over at Harrison Lake. Will oh, interesting. It's on Vancouver. Oh, there's more than one of these. There are many Harrison Lakes. There's one on Vancouver Island. There's one uh, a little more inland towards Kelowna. And then there's one a little further north. You want to know something crazy? That one up there, that would be colder, by the way, the one up north there. Yeah. The place, you see that place on the other side of the border in Alaska, Ketchikan? I've been there. Right there. That little place. Here? Yep. When I was a kid, my family drove across the entirety of Canada and all the way to Alaska. You drove to here? Yes, from here. By the way, we're in Toronto. Well, like a boat? Like yeah, once we got once we, yeah, you, you got to oh, okay. exactly. <laughs> to get there, you got to get or a, like a huge bridge. You got to get on a boat and I'll never oh. forget actually cuz I get on this boat and it's whales over there and oh, yeah. and but you want to know the funniest thing? I'm on this ferry to go to Alaska and for some reason it's sticking in my mind they had one arcade machine in the ferry mm -hmm. old fashioned uh, quarters to play the game and it was Street Fighter mm -hmm. and it was the Neo Geo oh wow what a weird like see here's the thing I didn't it's know one I, of those memories I didn't know just... I was unlocking that today yeah yeah but that was that was young me and then another I'll give you one more moment that took place because obviously the nature and what whatnot is unbelievable over there yeah i know look at this look at this ken unbelievable stuff yeah th that's it man that's the cabinet this is the one no no no, no. to the right yeah the neo geo cabinet uh -huh. what did that even neo geo get out oh my god and all i want i want is only quarters to play this thing i should have been looking at the whales though i know <laughs> goes to show you which i did i looked at the whales don't worry like one more game, mom. Anyway, I got one more from that trip. I came face to face with a bald eagle. I was on this, I was going to this restaurant, which you had to take a gondola to get to. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it was elevated. And you get to, you're in the, kind of in the mountains at this restaurant. And I'm sitting at the window seat. And all of a sudden, a bald eagle just rolls in. And just perches right beside, like this type of distance from here to the to the to that wall. Oh, and I'm just eating my meal, and I'm I'm head to head with the bald eagle. Wow! So that was wonderful as well. I, what am I? What are we doing? We're doing a trip down memory lane over here, but I couldn't. Once I saw the city there, I was like, I gotta mention this right now because we got to Harrison Lake, which then brought sure. us. To, I couldn't avoid it. Will? Yeah. And uh, now I feel like I need a road trip or something because we went past Lake Louise. Have you ever seen Lake Louise? No, but I've heard great things. I would like to go. I mean, it doesn't even seem like real. It, feel, it doesn't even feel like it's on. Yeah, the water. It just seems yeah, it too perfect. It's almost like a video game. Or sure. something. It seems too. But I didn't know that at the time because it wasn't a lot of video games. We, we just rolled up in our car and then and then we're standing like, there. There it is. <laughs> And, and then we're standing there, and I'm just like, what, what? How has the earth... More people should... Well, I don't know. I don't want to ruin and Lake... And you started... I don't want to ruin therapy. Lake Louise or anything, but <laughs> it's in, it's unbelievable. A, a truly unbelievable yeah. place. It's like how you would draw as a kid if you were trying trying to draw the most amazing 
sure landscape like you would have a, a sun and some mountains and some trees and you'd have this incredibly blue water okay anyways <laughs> yeah so the guy so they found the phone they got it back to the owner she got all her photos from the trip she was very happy about this and the the main part is of course you know when it comes to the iPhone uh, it has some degree of water resistance and it probably has more than you think especially when it comes to fresh water, which you would find in a place like Harrison Lake, mm. because now you don't have the salt, the salt. And, and, and stuff screwing things up. Corrosion. And so now you have an iPhone 11, relatively recent phone, which is would be nice to find. She did buy another phone in the meantime, but still nice to get it back. And look how clear the water actually is. That's mm. a pretty, pretty cool place to dive. Not too bad to uh, look for treasure. Here. No, not at all. Very, very nice place to dive. Look how clear the water is right there. Oh, some other phones. Yeah, a Motorola Razor. Crazy. Uh, anyway, so the phone is very water resistant in that particular circumstance six months later and working as if nothing ever happened to it. The iMac Pro uh, RIP, it has been discontinued. This is the powerhouse sort of pro iMac. It had a Xeon chip in it and it had... Another thing that was cool about it, it had this space gray finish, which mm -hmm. wasn't typically on the iMac. And so that's how you knew it was pro. And I think it came with a space gray keyboard and mouse. I think so. Which also enhanced the pro aspect. Anyway, they're getting rid of it. Of course, everything has to be transferred over away from Intel and to Apple's own silicon. And so there's going to be some casualties along the way. I don't know if they're going to do another pro iMac or if it would just be the M M1 iMac type of thing or will they call it something? I don't I don't know. But in the meantime, they got to get rid of this one. They are still selling it only because it's in, they're getting rid of the leftover inventory. Mm -hmm. And so you can't, I don't think you can custom spec it. You can't do anything to it. You have to buy the, this three gigahertz, 10 core model with boost up to 4.5 gig gigahertz, you have 32 gigs of RAM. You can, it looks like you can configure that. It does say configurable there. Can you get more RAM? Let me see, scroll down. I don't think you can. If you click buy, is it gonna let you put more RAM if you want or not? No, doesn't look like it. Wait, what? You click buy and you can't even buy it right now. Oh yeah, where's the... Uh it, 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 it sort of shut you down after you clicked buy. That's very bizarre. He broke the website. Anyway, it says while supplies last. I don't know. It's still listed for sale at $5,000. Currently unavailable for pickup. Order today delivers March 31st. This is going to depend on your physical location, I sure. guess. But anyway, this is the only spec it appears you can get. And the fact that they put while supplies last everybody realizes at this point that it is uh, on the way out and going to be discontinued and maybe it will never exist again in that particular uh, format so i don't know rip is that fine is anyone going to miss it somebody will yeah somebody will collect it google is testing a beefed up youtube android app for chromecast it's a funny story with chromecast it's a uh, had a lot of twists and turns. In my life, I've found Chromecast to be very convenient, but then it also feels lacking in other ways. Hmm. And it seems like Google has recognized such a thing because all their, or at least a lot of their recent developments have attempted to make Chromecast more comprehensive and rely less on the phone itself by, by leaning into Android TV stuff, providing remote controls. I mean, original Chromecast, I'm sure you remember, Will, it was all... Everything was coming from the phone. Yeah, you cast it. There's like That's a it. button on every app. That's it. It's just yeah. cast or nothing. It wasn't a UI or anything like that. No. And now they're making it more comprehensive, trying to compete, I suppose, with the other streaming equipment that people have, whether it's Roku or Apple TV or something like this. And so that means enhancing certain aspects, certain behaviors, including the YouTube Android app for Chromecast. So apparently they're working on a new version that significantly improves the Chromecast experience. Currently, casting a Chromecast connected TV using the YouTube app is a minimalistic experience. With the new version, however, it will be more akin to Android TV. So a much more 
comprehensive. And I have to say, I, I just think it's a better move. I, the Android TV stuff, super convenient, w easy to understand. I, I mean, obviously the experience pulled from all the other streaming boxes that exist. Mm -hmm. But the key factor for me is Assistant. I just, I just like interacting with a TV interface using Assistant. Voice seems to be super helpful from the couch. Yeah. You don't have any other fast input. And so anyway, yeah. If you're a Chromecast user, expect an enhanced YouTube experience. Polymer cables to replace Thunderbolt and USB and deliver twice the speed. I'm a big cable guy. I am, you are. I am the yeah. cable guy. Uh, I would say so. That was a movie. Cable guy, Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey, yeah. And then it was also, was it also a comedian? Larry the Cable Guy? Yeah, wow. The ca so Cable Guy, the Cable Guy. Is there a Cable Guy anymore? Who is what the? Do you mean? Well, <laughs> no, I don't mean I don't mean Larry the Cable Guy. I mean the idea of the guy who comes to connect the cable. Yeah, that guy still exists, but he's sure. mostly internet now. You don't call him the Cable Guy anymore. Well, there's still coaxes around. No, no, I know. <laughs> I know cables still exist, but like you recently purchased a house. Yep. And, oh, congrats. Shout out. I don't know if we Thanks. said that yet. And uh, did you, did the cable guy come? Would you have said, oh, I have the cable guy is on his way over? No. no I feel like I, you. I, yeah. I didn't set up cable, but I set up internet. Yeah. So, but even if he was going to add cable, you probably would still call him the internet guy. Sure. Yeah, because I think internet encompasses exactly. More so That's the what I'm phone saying. The shift, like the cable. Actually, phone is in and of itself. But anyways, so this phone. is uh, this is a nice cable. I have had my cable difficulties over the years. I've been a big fan of Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt has some issues as far as range is concerned. Particularly, I've been trying to drive those six. Uh, K monitors and you can't go you got you can go like 10 feet with a thunderbolt cable to mm. get the amount of the the type of bandwidth you're looking for and then beyond that and i did this with old thunderbolt stuff you're you're in optical land oh. i had an old version of thunderbolt maybe thunderbolt 2 i remember at the one of the old studios i was having this 200 foot corning optical cable in order to have this shared storage i was using at the time which had to live between a couple of different systems that were far away. Yeah, it was it was that cable right there, that optical one on the left. Very expensive technology, and obviously it was replaced by much faster, more modern Thunderbolt, and so it's kind of useless for now. But it was still it's still a fast cable. You're looking at 10 gigabit per second bidirectional. Oh no, up to 20 gigabit per second transfer speeds. Daisy chain support. Big. I was just a big Thunderbolt guy over the years. Very exciting connector. Now, the, the problem was the optical companies, companies like Corning, they didn't bother to do new versions of that cable. At least not the last time I looked. It was People would rumor, and you'd be in the forums, cable dudes would be like, when are they going to do it? It would be guys who have like a studio set up and have to have their computer far away from where their monitors are. Uh -huh. It's a, a very niche thing, but cable tech is interesting to me. Anyway, this polymer tech... The idea here, twice the speed of Thunderbolt, but not needing to use optical like those old cables, fiber optic cables, and instead going with a, a type of plastic, plastic polymer, hmm. making it cheaper to manufacture than copper wires, which could be an attractive proposition for cable producers. But the key here is tremendous throughput for this technology as well. A total bandwidth of 105 gigabits per second. Wow. That is, that's a monster right there. It gets yeah. me going. gets me very excited. The small hair-like cable can be used to transport data over three different parallel channels, enabling it to achieve a total bandwidth of 105 gigabits per second. Bundling conduits together could bring the cable into the terabit per second range while still remaining at a reasonable cost. So... We might, uh, this kind of thing might be around the corner. We'll have to wait and see. But currently, Thunderbolt-style connections 
are around 40 gigabit per second upper limit. Mm. So you're talking about more than doubling that and the potential to bundle it. I'll take a polymer cable. Sounds great. For sure. I'm sure there's challenges involved in figuring out how to implement such a thing. They're working on it. It was a recent presentation in February, but we'll have to wait and see. This could be the future. Cables could be uh, the next Thunderbolt. I don't know. We'll mm -hmm. see. I think I showed you this thing. Maybe it was Friday. I don't yeah. know how to pronounce it. The Aya Neo or Aya Neo. This thing, I looked at the box and I was like, oh man, I want to check this out. Uh -huh. It kind of got me going a little bit. And I believe, do we have the Founders Edition as well? Because I think we might have a Founders we? Edition. Well, you're on the Indiegogo at the moment, and look how much money they raise on this thing. 1.375 million USD. This is a portable, it's a gaming, a handheld gaming device with a spec sheet that just, I was, almost fell over. Did you? I'm still recovering just from the spec sheet. So it looks cool because it, it looks like a Switch. It looks, yeah. But it's a PC. It's a PC that looks exactly like a Switch and has a spec sheet that'll get you, that'll make you fall over. That's what, I, that's what happened to me. Okay. AMD Ryzen 5, 4500U APU, 7-inch display, 16 gigs of LPDDR4X RAM, uh, running at 4,266 megahertz. The device has a 12,000... 300 milliamp hour battery capacity split across three cells and it's available with up to one terabyte of m.2 2280 nvme storage so it's 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 like a uh, it's kind of like almost like a gaming laptop inside of a handheld package and the one that we have i don't know if it's the founder's edition but it's clear so you can see all the internal components all right yeah, that, that's the one we have right there. So you have trigger buttons, you have a joystick. It that's, also has some sort of ex potential Xbox integration. Right. Point being is there's a demand for such a thing because, well, look at the money that they raised. They say the 47, just scroll up a little bit, 47 watt hour battery capacity and low power consumption leads you to five to six hours of battery life at lower TDP settings and up to 140 minutes of gaming for triple A, demanding triple A titles. It has fast charging to take a full charge in as little as 90 minutes. And I'm sure some people will use it plugged in as well. The display spans the entire height of the device, this seven inch diagonal display, 800p native, 215 PPI, and a 500 nit peak brightness, which is bright, Will. It is, yes. And I haven't said this in a while, but you're a big knit guy. Yes, I, I like knits. 500 is not nothing. I played around with a lot of laptops, and I happen to know 500 is is usually more than you need. You could probably even play it a little bit outside, in fact. Mm. It's got rumble motors built in, six-axis gyroscope. Now, of course, we're going to do a video. We have it here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see... We get the Cyberpunk going. They advertise the Cyberpunk 2077 on there. Yep. And it's been a thing we've been trying to figure out. Can you really do decent Cyberpunk on a handheld? Now, what do they say as far as frame rate is concerned? Where Cyberpunk is, is... 30 FPS. Yeah. I can't really... Uh, wait a second. 15 watt TDP balance default. Okay, if you switch to high performance mode, it's 30 FPS at the default resolution. Are you satisfied with this, Will? <laughs> Yeah. It looks like you could play other <laughs> yeah, titles. So, right? What is it, like NBA 2K21, 60 FPS, FIFA 21, 60 FPS, uh, Bioshock 3 at 60 FPS, Rise of the Tomb Raider, 60 FPS. So some of them are 30, a couple of them are 60, and that's at the high-performance setting. So keep in mind, you're not going to get tremendous battery life. But, I mean, just the idea, you played a AAA title sure. from on the couch in the handheld. Yeah. There's a dock with it. I don't know, Will. It's kind of cool. Come it on, is. man. Come on, Will. I hear you. Porsche is taking a bigger stake in the electric hypercar company Rimac with a brand new investment. Actually, this investment brings them to almost 25% ownership. This company is doing the electric hypercars. Of course, a relationship like this means 
probably that Porsche can implement some of these technologies into their own vehicles. Now, you know, I'm personally an owner of an electric Porsche, and the thing is just a, a, a feat of engineering, mm -hmm. to say the least. <laughs> Very cool in the studio. It's just to appreciate. You know, just yeah. to, like it's a work of art. Yeah, just to appreciate. Sure. Metal and batteries and uh, yeah, they all come together. What a time to be alive! Type yeah. type of feeling. Yeah. Well, this takes it to another level. Look at the C2 that you were just hovering. That's the newest uh, Rimac vehicle demonstrating the full range of Rimac capabilities. I don't know if you can click on it from there. I think you can. Yeah, there you go. Look at this thing, Will. Tell me something. Take a look at this and tell me something. Whatever comes to your mind. Okay. First of all, how about the website? A car alive with technology. So you got to push the button to start. Wow, this web design is out of control. It's a whole experience. You've, you, you didn't get you didn't design any sites like this, did no. you, Will? 0 to 60, 1.85 seconds. Top speed, 412 kilometers per hour. 2.3... No. Is that right? Newton meters of torque, 300... Oh, the dot, they're using it as a as a comma, 2,300. Oh. The Rimac, oh, go back up one sec. Oh. The, I, you can't. I, You're it's dead. It's a whole experience, I told you. I screwed oh, up Oh, man. Anyway, uh, this thing looks ridiculous. The doors go up. So you know it's a supercar. I don't know what the price is. Do they list a price for such a thing? You're not allowed to click anything I, I right now. You're stuck. Do anything here. I feel like you just scrolled though, didn't you? I don't know. It's I'm carbon fiber. It's going down. <laughs> it's carbon fiber all over uh, it. Yeah, yeah. You're. It is working what you're doing. It's just hard to know that you're doing it. Yeah. Pure electric GT hypercar as capable on track as it is as, at crossing continents. A, a car as bespoke as it's user friendly as it is user friendly. A new breed of hypercar. So it's got seats, it's got more room on the inside. Porsche it. likes it. They're investing money. They just gave them another 70 million, or they invested, I should say, another 70 million euros to increase its ownership, their ownership of the company to oh, 24%. Okay. $2 million price tag? Yeah, it makes sense. Well, this company actually supplies other hypercar makers, apparently, including and this is so difficult to pronounce the name of this company, Koenigsegg. Yeah. Uh, Rimac is excellent, excellently positioned in a prototype solutions and small series. Mate Rimac and his team are important partners, especially when it comes to supporting us in the development of components. Rimac is well on its way to becoming a tier one supplier for Porsche and other manufacturers in the high tech segment. Porsche has already placed its first orders with Rimac for the development of highly innovative innovative series components. Both sides will benefit from this enhanced level of cooperation in the future. And apparently this some of their tech is uh, set to show up in the new Porsche Macan Electric. Cool. Expected to be the first Porsche branded vehicle to get some technology from Rimac based in Croatia. I don't know, Will. Tell them to get us. To, tell them to bring this car to, to the studio. Okay. Sure. Just send them a quick. Hey, how's it going? Uh, I'm Willie Do. And I'm perked. <laughs> that might work. That yeah. might work. We'll see what happens. That might work. Speaking of electric stuff, electric vehicles. How about a uh, mega battery grid from a company you may have heard of, Tesla? You probably saw some of those stories about the big energy issue in Texas mm -hmm. when things got cold. Tesla increased uh, uh, commitment to Texas, as you know, Cybertruck, Austin, space. Yes. All the, all the Elon things yeah. connecting to Texas at the moment. Well, here we have a secret mega battery getting plugged into the Texas grid. The utility scale battery located outside of Houston will connect to the same grid that faltered in February's freeze. It is a mega giant battery. All right. I'm going to tell you something. It, 100 megawatt energy storage project. Look how they just roll up big battery style. You know what you can do with 100 megawatts, Will? What's that? Oh, how about power 20,000 homes on a hot summer day? 
I said 20,000 homes. Wow. I need this type of stuff for the for the mining rig, you know. <laughs> 20,000 homes on a hot summer day. 100 100 megawatt. Yeah. That's lovely. Anyway, they weren't necessarily trying to advertise it. Apparently, like someone saw a Tesla logo on one of the workers' hard hats and they, you know, it was they were like Tesla. They were snooping around. Yeah. They were snooping around. Property records on file with the Brazoria County show Gambit shares the same address as a Tesla facility near the company's auto plant in Fremont. This is the company called Gambit, associated with Tesla or a subsidi subsidiary. Uh, executives from Tesla did not respond to multiple requests for comments. So I don't know. Is this part of the future? Is this how Texas potentially avoids such a thing happening in the future? Storing more energy? That's what you can do with batteries, Will. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah. You can, I mean, it's nice to have Tesla in your state. Nearby. Yeah. You just call them up. Okay. Hey, can you uh, supply us? Well, I got to I gotta imagine, even if you're Elon and you're sitting there and it's the massive power outage and it's affecting you and you're like, wait a sec. Yeah. Can we get some batteries? Like, you just pick up the phone. You're like, I got these batteries. Why don't we? Yeah, I have a solution right here. <laughs> you can warm up some houses. I suppose battery tech on that scale, though, you have to imagine difficult stuff as far as manufacturing is concerned. Right. That level of volume. But if anybody could figure it out, I suppose they could because uh, this is selling. they're selling some cars, mm -hmm. and those cars all have batteries. If someone can figure it out, maybe they can. Yeah. Anyway, that's a lot of power. Welcome to the crypto section of the show, Beyond Bitcoin. Hmm. This, I don't know if you read this story, but this is the first big public purchase of Ethereum instead of Bitcoin, or at least in conjunction with Bitcoin. Hmm. This beauty app, Maitu, Maitu, bought 22 million in Ethereum, which happens to be my crypto of choice. You're well aware, Willie Do. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about the reasoning for it. Maybe... Maybe just a bet based on the fact that it has seen some recent rise. It has actually been accelerating a little bit faster than Bitcoin in recent days. Fujian-based beauty app Meitu, which is publicly listed in Hong Kong, said it has purchased 15,000 units of Ethereum on Sunday. Hmm. The purchase is worth, or was worth at the time, $25.98 million. And ETH traded 4.28% higher at 1727.92. The company also bought some Bitcoin at the moment, but a little bit less, around 19 million worth at the same timing. Hmm. And I don't, again, it's a, I think we have to kind of speculate as to why they distribute it this way. Maybe they're envisioning a higher price spike for Ethereum than Bitcoin, or maybe they're just hedging it. I don't. I don't really know. The incentive to do such a thing but of course i don't know if we've talked about it on this show but a lot of changes are potentially coming to ethereum with the uh the improvements the de de depending on who you ask and yeah. part of it is this idea that ethereum would there would you, you would burn some some of it and therefore limit the supply of it hmm. which as you know will scarcity yeah things like this yeah there's but we're going to talk more about that, actually. Oh, okay. Because we're not done informing you. The crypto coin outperforming Bitcoin is about to see supply reduced coming via Bloomberg. Was that was that good enough for you, that transition right there? Sure. Will? Yeah. Crypto. The proposal has been approved to destroy some Ether used in transactions. Ether has gained 536% in the past year, which is more than Bitcoin believe it or not, which seems crazy because Bitcoin has been hmm. out of control. This move reduces the amount of outstanding Ether by destroying some of the tokens every time it is used to fuel transactions. On the world's most used blockchain, this proposal, by the way, uh, EIP-1559, solves the problem of users not being able to estimate how much Ether is needed for transactions to be processed. Of course, it's controversial because miners have their own opinion on such a thing, worried they're going to be cut out or at least not earn as much. But there's all kinds of uh, aspects to this very uh, complex considerations on either side. 
And uh, the idea here is to reward those that hold such a currency. Mm. And if you have, if you, or not a currency, asset, I don't know what you want to call it. Call it whatever you want to call it. Okay. Ether. And, and then by burning it off, you're effectively taking all kinds out of circulation, therefore even further encouraging those that hold it to continue to hold it because they keep seeing it go up in value. So I don't know, maybe the last group from the previous article is sitting there reading this stuff and saying, you know what? We should have a little bit of that. But it is interesting, these companies holding. I'm, uh, Tesla purchasing, I don't remember what it was, $1.5 billion, mm -hmm. preparing themselves and saying, you know what? If we're going to have all this cash sitting around, maybe we're going to put it over here. Sure. Yeah. But uh, I know you were curious. You were, you were sitting there thinking, wait a sec, it outperformed Bitcoin? Apparently, I feel like I got to give you the spec on that because you seem very concerned over there. In the same period of time, Bitcoin is up 430% and Ether has risen 560% mm. in that time period. So both, uh, obviously, huge rises, but yeah. I saw you got very concerned there. No, no, I'm good. Uh, last crypto story, or maybe second last. This one's interesting. I don't know if you saw how Mark Cuban is now accepting Dogecoin. Is for he? the Dallas Mavericks. Did you hear the, hear about this? No. So I guess he, I don't know. He must have bought a bunch. And it's <laughs> like one way you can accelerate the value of such a thing is by accepting it. So the uh, he now claims the Dallas, Dallas Mavericks are the largest Dogecoin merchant in the world. Apparently they have carried out more than 20,000 Dogecoin transactions. And the investor said if his team sells merch worth another 6.5 billion Dogecoin the token price could hit $1. Right. Now, it, what's funny here is that originally he was kind of goofing on Dogecoin a little bit. He said he bought some for his son. Not yeah. not as a goof, but just kind of... Like a fun activity. Sort of, yeah. But then it seemed like he got real serious about it because the Dallas Mavericks are all about Dogecoin right now. Now, this works on a couple of levels. Obviously, he could make some money himself if this thing he's talking about does actually happen but it also look what happens i mean the article pops up and the dallas mavericks seem innovative or new or fresh and same they with him technology yeah and all of a sudden mentality. i'm like yeah that's my team my team lets me do what i want to do right. my team lets me pay in doge if i want to uh -huh. and as you can see look man it's still going give me a month give me a month on it you're looking at the week chart Okay, so it it's not at its, its because peak. of the Elon. Yeah, yeah, there was. Tweets. I think he it, a lot of traffic at that time. At that time, but you can't do it all the time, right? No. Like you can overdo it as well. Yeah, but it looks to be climbing a little bit based on some of this this news. If you if you look at uh, the the more recent history, but it I mean, it is not at its peak yet. But it found a little bit of support there. Sure, we have a little bit of a flat. A little flat support over there. Anyway, uh, yeah. If you're in, if you're a Dallas Mavericks fan, go ahead and and purchase some merch with your Doge. Sure. Bring it up to a dollar. Oh, I guess this is technically a crypto story, but this is about Jack Dorsey auctioning his first tweet as digital art. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw this or yeah, heard about it. I think over the weekend, right? Yeah, he put up his first tweet, which says, the tweet was, just setting up my Twitter, T-W-T-T-R, the shortened form of Twitter. At the time, you were using Twitter over SMS. Mm -hmm. Nobody remembers this. It was March 21st, 2006. That is yeah. so crazy. This first At tweet. At like what? South by Southwest? The first the tweet, event. 2006. Wow, man. Yeah. Anyway, Times. so jumping on the NFT hype, it's like, why, why don't we just sell the very first tweet as an NFT, non-fungible token? Why don't we just do that? And so he shared a link to the, I guess, auction. That was on Friday afternoon. And the highest offer at the time of this article was $2.5 million. That was at Saturday, Saturday afternoon. We should probably click the link right now because I'm, gonna, I'm guessing it might be higher than $2.5 million at the moment. So this is the first tweet. That's it. That's that is the just setting up my Twitter. That's it. Jack. 3:50 p.m. March 21st, 2006. I mean, it's got a lot of action on it. Look at all the replies. Yeah. And which makes sense. It's the first tweet ever. Where's the link? NFTs are exploding in popularity across 
this variety of places in which you, they can be listed. Uh, there, They didn't post a link over here. You're going to have to Google it. But you can just type uh, first tweet NFT. He posted it on his Twitter account, but I feel like that would take you longer to go and click through to it. Uh-oh. It's all news instead of the actual link. One of them has to link the actual no, no. auction. No? No? Are you certain about this? Then I'm going to have to simultaneously oh you know what they did link it because if you go up and then click share to tweet that will bring you at least to the tweet which has the link isn't this uh, tremendously riveting content right here there we go so it is sitting at 2.5 million still the highest offer is 2.5 million from Sina Estavi that is the CEO of Bridge Oracle but I don't know what is the time limit on this does it say Counter offer must be a minimum increase of a dollar or ten percent, whichever is more. It doesn't look to have a time limit. Does it hit a threshold or? Uh, yeah, it doesn't say. Someone's uh, gonna let us know in the comments how he how he managed it. But the weird thing is, the he didn't really announce it in a formal kind of way, did he? Uh, it was just. I think Jack Dorsey just posted the link, and that's it. Yeah, he did. You got to know what it's about. That's how cool it is, Will. Yeah, very new age. Yeah, it was just a link. He didn't really explain the time limit on the auction. I don't know. Does it hit a certain number? I don't know. Anyway, point being is it seems that you can anything can be an NFT, Will. Yeah. Anything. Even, uh, even the next thing you say right now. Okay. NFT. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, this next one. Holy cow. This one is so difficult. This huh. is... Did you see this, by the way? Uh, This one? This is so difficult. This? Oh, this? Yes. This is so difficult. Can you read this for me? Okay, this is oh, from... This boy. is... This is from Burger King UK... I don't want <laughs> This was trending. I'm going to get canceled. This was trending number three today on Twitter. Okay. It was posted 4.01 a.m. That's interesting. I guess because Burger King UK. So and in it's the, still up. In the morning. In UK. It's still up, which is, I was wondering if it was going to still be up when I uh, got to the, when we actually filmed it, this and show. They're They're replying to tweets. They're right? replying to tweets. They're, they're defending it. They're defending it. Okay. Okay. What's read the read the tweet to me, Will. Oh, it's going to be cut. Re read the tweet to me, Will. Okay. So Burger King uh, tweeted. I already said that part. Women belong in the kitchen. Yeah. They tweeted women belong in the kitchen. All right. It's part of a bigger campaign in which they're talking about professional chefs that it's only 20% women in all kinds of categories of chefs. And they say, we're on a mission to change the gender ratio in the restaurant industry by empowering female employees with the opportunity to pursue a culinary career because you got 80% of chefs that are men. But the tactic they used to start this conversation was just the tweet, like that was a reply tweet. It's just the tweet, women belong in the kitchen. And it's been so crazy for me to watch. Like I was, first of all, the tweet is out of control popular. 140,000 retweets. It's at, Will, at 4 a.m. Like this is not an old tweet. It is flying. 150,000 quote tweets and over half a million likes. And you can watch it going up in real time. Well, this is UK time too, because it's Burger King UK. What yeah, yeah, time yeah. Is it there at? No, no, no. You're seeing your time. You're seeing your time for a while. Yeah, that's what I mean. What time would it be? Five hours UK? ahead. It was in the morning. It was nine a.m. Nine a.m. Oh, right. Okay. For them, yeah, it right. doesn't. It's not. It, it, the point I'm trying to make is that this tweet is relatively recent and it has some crazy numbers on it. Right. That's all they had to do to get into trending. And I am telling you, I'm sure that Burger King is going to say we did this tweet to elicit the reaction that you had because you were about to be outraged. And we used your own outrage in order to showcase to you our own good cause. 
Right. Yeah. That that we wouldn't we have just want to get your attention first. That we wouldn't have gotten your click had we not been this outrageous. Sure. To say the thing that we knew would strike the chord with you. And then to go on and say And it worked. <laughs> and it worked, but then to go on and say to like use it against you, your outrage, to say, oh, if you're outraged at that, then you should also be outraged that 20% of chefs are women. Like they, but it didn't, but it worked, but it didn't work because it worked in the sense that it got the attention on it, but then it didn't work because obviously people are upset. Mm -hmm. Like here's the, one of the top responses, Burger King belongs in a trash can. Right. And, and then. That's that's quite a lot of likes. But then well. look at the next one. This just in, woman doesn't understand how jokes work. Oh boy. And that's 14,000 likes on that one. And then we get into meme town. And then you get into <laughs> meme town and it's like the whole thing gets lost and you're just staring back at your own outrage. This is such a complicated breakdown. It is such a complicated breakdown because it is, it becomes this thing that anybody can use to represent whatever they want to represent. Sure. It's staring back in a mirror. Somebody can look at it and say, yeah, women belong in the kitchen. But somebody else can look at it and say, oh, Burger King is doing this, uh, they're, 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 they have this campaign, campaign to yeah. encourage this thing or to actually maybe more than encourage. I think that they're, it's going to cost them money, right? We're proud to be launching a new scholarship program, which helps female Burger King employees pursue their culinary dreams. But then this message gets lost because of the outrage. But the message was lost to begin with because they didn't have the, without the heat on the original sure. tweet, yeah. how many, like the top tweet there, the top reply has 119,000 likes. There is no way that without the first tweet, that tweet would yeah. have 120. If they started with this. No chance. Yeah. So it's you end up in this catch where it's like you kind of need to strike a chord with people to get their attention because of how noisy the internet is. Sure. Of course, there's always an opportunity to potentially be more elegant with it, but maybe there's not. Because maybe if you went the elegant path, which everybody does all the time, it would look like all the other signals out there, mm -hmm. and therefore it would capture your attention. Like the way you looked at it, like, oh boy, don't make me read it. Yeah. Well, I'm programmed to be, I guess, careful in that sense. To no, no, try no. Try to be politically. No, careful. no, no, no. no. I, I, dude, I'm not I, saying yeah. you. I'm saying anyone who I, reads yeah, it. I know. When you see this tweet, you know right away, oh boy, here we go. Sure. That yeah. feeling of, oh boy, here we go, is what they were looking for uh -huh. in order to capture your interaction and therefore spread their message. Now, the question is, was it worth it? Right? The question is, is that exchange a valid one? It, it, what, what is bigger, the overall good or the overall bad? Right. And it's, it's open for discussion, but it's edgy. It's very edgy for it Burger edgy. King. And the fa yeah. how come the fast food companies became the edgiest social media accounts? Yeah, what is like that about? Wendy's? Like, you know. But it's huge, man. I don't know. It's got to be one of the hottest tweets I've seen in a really long time. And I'm talking strictly about interaction. Yeah. And I think it's going to be hard for brands to ignore the fact, like, what it takes to stand out in 2021. It takes, apparently, you gotta, you have to cl click the trigger on some people, apparently. Mm -hmm. I don't know. How bigger do you think it would be if it was Burger like, they King? They have 81,000 followers. Uh, yeah. The Burger King UK account has 81,000 followers. Well, what if Burger King, like the, the main one, tweeted it? Been a lot more. I don't think it needs it at that point because you're talking about hitting the trending page. Like the general public had a chance to see it at this point and they're just reading the Burger King headline. Like I don't think that they're really Im imagining who it came from. Right. Uh, you're right. It probably would have gotten off faster if it was the main Burger King account. But it does It does beg the question. That's a different tweet. How does the main Burger King account feel about the Burger King UK social account and the move that they've made? Because you know yeah. that they're going to be taking heat There's as well. There's internal discussions. 
happening. But, and then on the whole top of the whole thing, regardless of the political viewpoint, they're just selling burgers. Like what I mean to say is Burger King got a million interactions today on social media. They 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 are at the top of social media. They they are a fast food chain that is in the global trending section. Mm-hmm. So that happened as well. Yeah. Regardless of message. Mm-hmm. It's all super complex, all the inputs and outputs here. But the fact of the matter uh, is to, like, the way I look at this is I'm always trying to think, okay, what are you trying to do to me, right? Where and how are you trying to use my emotions in order to elicit a particular activity? Mm-hmm. And if more people... It's almost you have to disconnect from your feelings a little bit. You have to zoom out and sure. say what's their You have to observe motive? you have to observe your own emotions, your own outrage. Yeah. That's obviously not necessarily happening in the comment section here. But right. that's the nature of existing on the internet in this because all these people did what they wanted them to do. At the end of it all Right, yeah. this, all these interactions, Spark emotion, did the thing, mm-hmm. ultimately. And in the comment section, you can find whatever you want to find, but the volume knob is all the way up. You can't dispute it. The volume knob for Burger King is all the way up, no matter what you happen to be shouting back at it. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, it's uh, pe- yeah, people heavy. Get- People get caught up, man. It's complicated stuff. Anyway. You didn't even want to read it. It was just a tweet. No. You didn't even want to read it. Yeah. It's just a tweet. Well, I feel like I'm going to get like an out of context. I hear video. you, man. I or hear you. Hey, man, I hear you. That's never good. The internet. No. Here we have 30 pictures showing how much has changed in a year due to COVID. It's a. This is a quick... A quick little reminder how long we've been doing this thing. There's a couple of examples here. You scroll down. You got Santa Monica Pier. You can look at then versus now. Look at these people having a great time. They had no idea what was on the horizon. And then boom, just signs. signs. How many more signs are in our lives? Great sunset, though, for both. <laughs> they That's all the, I got to say. They picked the same time of day for yeah. the before and after. That's pretty cool. At You're the right. At very least, the lighting is still But how there. ugly are signs? How ugly are public health signs? It's, and it's so many because it's so many instructions. Yeah. For the record, I'm not saying that they shouldn't be there. I'm just saying it's just, man, it's, uh, there's nothing elegant about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, here we have the Super Bowl then versus now. So big crowd, fun times, then cardboard cutouts that look like people interspersed with actual people. Oh. We've all seen those. You have the Golden Globes then and now. Big crowd. Uh, the new Golden Globes. There's like a few people there. I thought it was completely virtual. There were a few people there. Hmm. But it was, I think the Golden Globes, I saw some ratings, like a lot, way fewer people watched it, obviously. NBA games then and now, and most NBA games are empty, although some cities have opened up very limited uh, audiences. We have movie theaters. That's pretty obvious. <laughs> the, the, the There's a movie theater before. Look at the movie theater after. It's just, <laughs> it looks like a hospital almost going into the theater. Yeah. Restaurants then you have, well, what is a typical bustling restaurant versus some bizarre uh, eating bubble cube. Bu- oh yeah, bubbles. They're, they are more bubblish. Classrooms then and now, man, you th- you've got to think about the kids. This things going been, been going on. It's just normal now for the kids hmm. to be to wear wearing the masks and separated by tape lines inside the classroom for distance. College is pretty much exclusively on Zoom. You have a Disneyland before and after, more of the same. Signs everywhere. Times Square basically empty. Mall of America is now a vaccination zone. Universal Studios. Anyway, lots of examples. The reason I bring this up is not to uh, make you depressed, Will. Well, it worked. What I'm doing this for is actually to tell you that we're on our way back to those before pictures. Are we? Yeah, the boom is coming. Okay. Oh, everybody's about to get back out there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, stop it. 
Well, I was telling you about the Roaring Twenties. Yeah, that's were, right. It's the Roaring Twenties. You were laughing at me for that. It's the Roaring Twenty Twenties. <laughs> it's coming back. It's only a matter I'm of time. I want you to picture it. I want you to picture yourself in a nice restaurant. Oh, yeah. At a sporting event. Sure. Movie theater. You got to keep that vision alive, Will, because... We need optimism. There now. it is. There yeah. it is. You hold on to some of it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be tomorrow. That's the thing. You know about delayed gratification. Yeah. Precursor to success in life. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be tomorrow, Will. It, the, 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 the cookie jar, as long as it's there, one day you're going to get that cookie. Yes. I'll tell you what, Will. Yeah. I'm the, ready for it. The marshmallow. The, the, the dual marshmallow. The mar Just skip the marshmallow today. I'll give you two tomorrow. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> <laughs> You're the marshmallow giver? I'm the marshmallow man! Oh, jeez. And it can't be tomorrow. I mean, mm -hmm. you're accumulating one marshmallow a day. It has to be in the next well, hour. We're all waiting in for In the study, it can't. It, it's like 45 minutes later for the next marshmallow. Sure. It's not, it can't be the next day. Well, we're all waiting for it. I'm just telling you marshmallows are on the way. Okay. I'm not talking about the DJ either. Uh, or maybe this is on the way. Maybe you prefer this to the marshmallow. Okay. This is called Guo Bing, which is the giant Chinese pancake three times the size of your face. Did you eat this before? Uh, don't, don't, wait, don't lie if you didn't have no, it. No, I, I don't think I'm familiar with it. I, I, I don't think I've ever seen it before. This is a, this is is a, a pancake? Well, it's kind of, I mean, it's huge. It's hard to call it a pancake. It kind of reminds me of, of of like crepes stacked together. If you've oh, ever right, seen yeah. a crepe cake before, yeah. But there's a fermentation aspect to it, so it's completely something unique that I never saw before. And when South China Morning Post hits me with it, uh, I couldn't I couldn't ignore it. I had to know more. Were you hungry at that time? Absolutely hungry. Well, you heard me before we even started shooting. I was thinking about lunch. Yeah. Uh, one of these Guo Bing can stretch up to 38 centimeters in diameter and weigh more than 2.5 kilos. This is, uh, uh, this is a food from northern China. And the key here is it is made with fermented dough, which, and, and, they, and this snack is more than 100 years old. And because of that fermentation aspect, it can last for a long time. In hot weather, it remains fresh for up to three days. It won't go bad. If it's cold weather, you can store it for a month and it won't go bad. Hmm. So I don't know. I mean, that's some ancient technology right there. Yeah. You don't need a refrigerator. You see how like the package, the exterior sort of seals up the the thin layer pancake insides yeah it's a lot of rubik's cubes here in this search i don't know why <laughs> <laughs> oh it is a they, there's a company that makes rubik's cubes i guess oh, okay. by the name wait a second wait a second will you, you spelt it wrong you said guo bing oh yeah is that what it's called you did yeah now we have a different looking pancake with feeling. This uh, one's uh, a lot thinner. Not feelings <laughs> 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 there that one on the right the giant one yeah, that's yeah, that's the, the one. Look at the layers and stuff, man. Um, you can click the video. It's a really cool video. A crispy Chinese pancake, a chef's plate, and you can see how they make it. Look at that. It looks delicious. I need some of this right now. Um, yeah, it it does look pretty good. Does the dough go the dough is flattened into thin sheets. The sheets are then brushed with oil and then folded and stacked on top of each other to form the Guo Bing's signature layers. Then the whole thing is wrapped inside a larger sheet of dough like a gift bag and flattened into a large pancake. What do you say? Would you give it a try or no, Will? Yeah, I'll give okay, it a try. Okay, you'll shot. give it a try. Perfect. Yeah. All right, this next one, honestly, I would normally not, normally not post or talk about something like this, but... Something salacious? It just, it just was too... It had so many elements to it okay that i couldn't avoid it and also it's gotten a lot of activity kind of i guess in a way reminds me of the tweet although 
nowhere near the action of that other tweet. This has 173,000 likes and 30,000 retweets. So it's not as hot as the Burger King tweet in terms of volume. But this isn't <laughs> a slugfest that took place between a customer and employees at an Arizona bath and body works store. Now, I think the reason I couldn't ignore it is because of the bath and body works component. It just seems like you're supposed to be in a relaxed mood in a place like that. Yeah, there's a fragrance to it. <laughs> I don't know. Very is it, meditative. Like, what is the music friendly. that's playing? And, 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 and you're thinking about... Bath time. Ba really. Yes. <laughs> I mean, what's more relaxing than bath and body works? Yeah. If you can't relax in there, I don't know. I can't imagine... Every other store would have to be so so very frustrating. Okay, so apparently, let me just break it down. There is a video. I don't know. You can show, show a small clip, a small clip, and I'll break it down for you. Apparently, what took place, this was at the uh, Arizona Fashion Square Mall viral clip. How many views does it have? On Twitter? It now has 10.5 million views. It was posted to Twitter. A whole fight just happened at Bath and Body Works. I'm dying. The original poster, Genevieve shows. And oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just you're in the Bath and Body Works. You're just smelling candles. <laughs> I just it's such a escalation. Apparently, what happened? You could play just a little bit more. Just play this portion right here. There you go. Wow. Oh. Anyway, so. Apparently what happened is it was an argument about distance in the line. And this shows you where people are at in 2021. It was an argument over the distance between each person standing in the line that somebody was too close to somebody else. Okay. Yep. And then it was taken as offensive. And the other but person... But this doesn't work at all because they're like face-to-face. -face well, you see how fighting. that goes, Will. You get so frustrated and you don't de-escalate the thing and then and then now everybody's rolling around. Yeah. And that's just the nature of being a human, isn't it? Is that you're you somehow it think... It always ends up this way. <laughs> you somehow think you're going to fix the situation by uh, grabbing onto one another. And sure. it, and it yeah. basically never fixes anything. Yeah. By grabbing onto one another. Now, if you go to the end of the video, they do eventually uh, break it up and the patrons move on. And the woman keeps shouting, I'm not leaving until I get my purse. Because I guess her purse was dropped at some point. The woman shouts, let go of me. As another customer and two staffers rush over to intervene, somebody else comes in to add to the thing. At some point. Now, I am sure, because you could have clips of fights all the time, so I'm sure the key thing here is the fact that it is at Bath & Body Works in Arizona. Wow. I think that's the key element that lets us laugh a little bit at it because it seems so... Out of place. Goofy like, for something place. like this to break out at yeah. a place like that. Uh... Apparently, the Bath & Body Works employees did try to de-escalate the situation... But then they wouldn't leave oh. loud and uncooperative the whole time before the before the fight took uh, started. Uh, yeah, <laughs> woman's just recording. Genevieve. Yeah, uh, and now uh, Bath and Body Works has to come out and say we're deeply concerned about the incident that took place at the store. Uh, the incident was started over someone cutting in line and. It was not mask nor race related, just a good old fashioned lineup issue. Oh, so it wasn't a distance thing. It was just someone cutting in the line. It was a line, yeah, something to do with the line. <laughs> I mean, who's really going to know at this point? But it is going to be hard for people. People are going to have to remember the going out in public thing uh -huh. because everything's opening or a lot of things are opening back up. And it's been like a year in some places that people haven't been in that proximity on a regular basis maybe and i don't know just remembering the the general politeness thing and yeah coexisting but you're at bath and body works though. i know i know you know it seems obvious that at bath and body works we're going to chill out a little bit but apparently not it's going to take some time people are going to figure it out roaring 20s here sure. we come